This episode of Data Party is brought to you by Skillshare. Formula One, one of the most data-rich sports on the planet. So why wouldn't we have a data party? With all of the news of the different records that are being broken here at the end of the turbo hybrid era, I thought it'd be interesting just to hit pause for a second. Just enjoy some of the best, the worst, and just the downright weird stuff that Formula One has accomplished. So that's what I promise you in this video. Obscure facts that you may or may not have known, or at least will challenge you a little bit further. And don't be shocked if you see some of these on the upcoming new F1 debunked playlist. And just as a spoiler alert, make sure to stick around until the end as we're going to cover some of my favorite stat lines to watch in the upcoming seasons that are on the eve of being broken. And now, welcome to the party. Vettel's always in a rush. Sebastian Vettel is one of Formula One's most iconic stalwarts, with the living legend and quad champion set to revamp the twilight of his career with the new Aston Martin outfit. And while most can name the three teams Vettel has driven for in F1, most leave out the fourth from this list. Seb would be crowned the youngest F1 champion in history in 2010 at Yas Marina, but some 1,540 days prior, the German ace would make his F1 debut with the Sauber team fulfilling FP1 duties at the 2006 Turkish Grand Prix. He was just 19 years and 53 days old, and as the title of number 10 suggests, Seb had a habit of being quick. And not just for racing, yeah we know about all these titles, the youngest blah blah blah, but also for penalties. It took him just 9 full seconds to get a penalty for speeding in the pit lane en route to his first ever official outlap. All things considered, it actually makes perfect sense. Of course he holds the fastest penalty acquired in a career, and thus we kick things off with arguably one of the more bulletproof of all the F1 records. I mean come on, who's gonna beat 9 seconds? The time traveling race winner. Well, it would be 53 days into his 19th birthday when Seb drove his first F1 into competition, Luigi Fagioli would be 53 years into his life dedicated to racing when he became the oldest Formula 1 Grand Prix winner with his shared drive with Fangio at the 1951 French Grand Prix. Astoundingly, the only winner born in the 1800s, this was very much not his first time around the block given his experience racing at top levels with Maserati and Mercedes. He was forced to swap cars with his teammate, which was typical at the time, and Fangio was dueling with Ascari. The win left the great Fangio ahead of Farina and the championship, but in the process, this would leave Fagioli 22 laps the loser, and especially disgruntled. The Italian veteran had a habit of thumbing his nose at such blatant team orders, and would retire sight on scene following the fourth round in Rasse. And as a little added bonus, it just so happens that this is a record all of its own, as standing as the longest F1 race in terms of mileage. Good things take time. 208. That's the record for the number of races without a win held by Andrea de Cesaris. And it's no wonder given he was racing in the ultra-competitive turbo era when teams were at the height of their respective dominance. While he may be the only one on this list to actually break the 200 barrier, there are a handful of other drivers who took more than 100 races to get their first win. Turns out, winning a Formula 1 race is incredibly difficult. Sounds dumb, I know, I know. But have you ever wondered what the data really looks like? Me too, don't worry, I got you covered. To illustrate my point, let's have a quick quiz. What do you consider reasonable odds for any driver on the grid to capture the top step of the podium? I'll wait. All right, all right, pencils down, time's up. Let me ask you this, what did you end up going with? Go ahead, say it out loud. I know, no one's judging you. All right, all right, understandable. I went with the well-rounded 50%, and I've morphed this statistic into what I've called win variance. That is, the number of different winning drivers in any given season divided by the number of Grand Prix in said season. Since the 1950 inaugural Drivers' World Championship, there have been, get this, a grand total of 21 seasons where win variance would breach that 50% mark. And this goes as high as the mega unpredictable 1982 season in which 11 different winners accounted for 16 races. It's worth noting that 6 of the 21 that I just mentioned are actually deadlocked at exactly 50% win variance. But that doesn't even tell the full story. What this is saying is less than a third of Formula 1 seasons consist of racing where it's a coin toss who could win a Grand Prix. In a sport that has 20 drivers at least right now, that's astounding. I know, I know, data heavy, sorry about that. But telling unique stories like this requires a lot of practice, a little bit of help, and a ton of curiosity. Which is why this specific episode of Data Party is brought to you by Skillshare. Many of you still ask me to this day, do I have writers, editors? No, but I do have Skillshare. Remember this graph for expressing win variance? You can thank Catherine Madden's class, Visual Thinking, Drawing Data to Communicate Ideas for inspiring that this. Like so many classes on Skillshare, I love that you can actually use the information immediately and it actually have an impact on your everyday life. 
But it doesn't stop there. Discover anything from filmmaking tricks for the one-person crew, or even email productivity. Work smarter with your inbox. That one is definitely on my list of things to do. Or you can scratch a creative itch, like graphic design. Not bad, right? They're always launching new premium courses for you to choose from so you never run out of things to explore. You can find classes that specifically meet your skill level and where you are. And Skillshare won't break the bank. It's super affordable at less than 10 bucks a month for the annual subscription. I'm a huge believer in the beginner mentality. So if you're a lifelong learner, make sure to use my link in the description. The first 1,000 people that use that link will get a free trial of the Skillshare Premium Membership so you can explore your creativity today. Now, back to the magic. The best man doesn't always win. Speaking of winning, the point system in Formula One has changed dramatically over the years, a total of six times in fact. It wasn't until 1991 that drivers were even able to capture double digit points, and for that luxury, you had to actually win the race to even do that. Moreover, it would be another dozen years or so before more than six finishers would even be eligible for championship points. Notably, Schumacher would torch the field in 2002, clinching the crown with north of a third of the calendar yet to be raced. It took this performance for the scoring system to include eight scores for the first time. Along with this shift, the comparative allocation from P1 to P2 was cut in half. Not only was the allocation changed, but also the amount of races eligible to be counted as scored events. Not always has every single race counted like it does today. By my count, and I could be wrong, but there have been two occasions in which the drivers that scored the most points weren't actually crowned champions due to the rule that best X amount of races only count toward the total. Consider the 1988 season in which Ayrton Senna would grab 8 wins to Prost 7 wins. But where Prost was unstoppable was his consistency, and as such, he'd match his tally for wins for runner-ups, totaling 14 in the points finishes, and not a single one of those below P2. I know, crazy. Go ahead and hit pause and check it. The problem is, not all of these would count, thus Prost would have 18 points deducted, giving Senna the title in 1988. To put that into perspective, if you apply that deduction, which amounted to 17%, to Hamilton's tally from, say, the 2017 title race, the result of that championship would look very different. It would actually be Sebastian Vettel winning 317 to Hamilton's 301. And the incident that actually laid the groundwork for this scenario was in 1964, with Graham Hill forced to watch his two classifications disintegrate, with as many points disappearing with him. This crushing blow would give John Surtees his only title on four wheels to accompany his four titles on two wheels. But the effects of such a rule that was thankfully done away with can look different. It actually sometimes can make results look significantly closer than they actually are. So one of my favorite topics, take the 1958 Drivers' Championship. Sterling Moss on paper looked to be the better driver despite losing the title by a single point on three more wins than the eventual champion Mike Hawthorne. But that not at all tells the full story of what happened. In reality, Moss left one of his six finishes on the table due to retiring his car at all other events. People somehow forget to mention that Hawthorne on the other hand would rack up 49 gross points but would have seven stripped away on just two retirements. It was still close, but not nearly as close as it was made out to be. Another interesting case study that speaks to really breaking down the data lies with the 1999 season. If you flip the script and apply the modern points allocation to the scoring total seen in that campaign, interestingly, you'd actually see a driver that was distilled down to a strong number two to Schumacher be a first time world champion in Eddie Irvine. The adjusted points tally would be 238 compared to Hakkinen's 222. Compatriots. I'll often get asked, what music is playing during the podiums? Which anthems? And the simple answer is, the winning driver's national anthem gets played, and then the anthem of the country the winning constructor represents. Finally, and when in doubt, just remember that Carmen plays while champagne sprays. This is why we're so used to hearing the British national anthem for Lewis, and then the German national anthem for Mercedes. Since the start of the Turbo era, we heard the German national anthem for years, at least once, as Red Bull also played it. It was only recently that Kimi and Leclerc would break this streak. While this data party entry isn't really about anthems at all, it's about compatriots. Each time I answer that question about the anthems, I always wonder how it must feel to be up there in P2 or P3 and get no way to celebrate with your country via your anthem. And then I got to thinking, how many times has all three drivers been represented by the same flag? That way no one would feel left out. I did all the hunting and the fact checking for you so you don't have to. Here is a list of races where the podium was made up of drivers that hail from the same country. Only on 17 occasions in the 70 plus years of this sport has the podium been made up of three drivers all driving under the same flag. It's not really all that surprising to see the British dominance made up in the 60s. 
and I make it no secret that Jim Clark is the best driver of all time in my opinion, so it's also not surprising to see that he's won each of these outings. And if you're wondering what this looks like by country, here it is. Probably the weirdest part of this entry on Data Party is the simple fact that this hasn't happened since 1983 San Marino. Number 3. The Three Time Legend Coming in at number 3 fittingly is the time that Hans Heyer failed three times in a single race. It took only 9 full laps to confirm a legend, and simultaneously earn a lifetime ban from Formula 1. You'll often hear this story referenced vaguely in a sentence or two, but today we'll shed some more details on a very interesting story. And don't worry, to anyone out there who finds this story as riveting as I do, I'll be covering this as a standalone in my coming series, Weird F1. Alright, so to set the stage, this is a story all about how- wait, wrong one. This is actually the story of the ATS team that was newly formed out of Germany. That 1977 season was the squad's debut year in Formula 1, and they had purchased the remnants of Penske. They'd go on to be a serious team despite Hire's antics. And to get that point across, they'd employ the likes of Robin Hurd in their second season to build the HS1. Hurd, of course, was one of the founding members of March Engineering, which would later be sold to Leighton House. His cross-discipline success would extend to Indy cars, where March cars would dominate the middle stretch of the 1980s at the Indy 500. They'd race until 1984, and many names you'd recognize had varying degrees of stints with the outfit. Until the team could be settled, they would occasionally run the second car. Now entering the chat, the legend. And this set up our man higher for his famous 1977 drive. Up to round 11, the ATS team had one consistent driver in Jean-Pierre Jarier, who had impressively earned three top 10 finishes, including a points finish for his P6 at Long Beach on his very first outing. He'd also go on to be one of the most beloved drivers by mild-mannered commentator James Hunt. And you've seen the sort of pig ignorance that you'd expect from Jarier, but I think he's suffering from old age a bit. I mean, he's got a mental age of 10 in the first place. He should certainly have a short suspension for that, and uh, for being himself, he should have a permanent suspension. By the time the grid went to Germany, the car that Hans got was relatively still uncompetitive. Not to mention, he had no real experience in a single-seater. He had raced at Hockenheim, though, placing six in an F2 race the year prior. So it wasn't totally foreign to him, but miracles would need to happen. Despite the hometown boost, he'd fail to qualify, missing out on the top 24 cutoff by 0.40. And it's worth noting here, while that was close, given the separation that far down the grid, there were still two other drivers ahead of him that just missed out. I mean, he did beat Emerson Fittipaldi for whatever that's worth. But failing to qualify, a little detail like that was not going to stop our man Hans. According to the available reporting at the time, he'd get a couple helpful marshals trackside to help him get the car out on track undetected. He took to the starting grid and somehow managed to go without anyone noticing. Amazingly, Hans made it 9 full laps before anyone even noticed that he was illegally on track. He was essentially outed by his gear linkage failure. But upon his discovery, he was promptly given a disqualification. Funny enough, Hans actually made it twice as far as the bona fide entrant of ATS and Jarier, who qualified a full two seconds ahead of his weekend teammate. Despite his blemish and subsequent banishment from F1, Hans had pace. He won three straight Spa 24s. He also managed to win with Johansson at the 12 Hours of Sebring in 1984 along with a number of other category wins. For better or for worse, and I lean the former, his name will forever be etched into the lore of F1 as the only driver to DNQ, DNF, and DQ all in the same race. We salute you, Hans. Number 2. A Glitch in the Matrix As we've already discussed, winning in Formula 1 can take an entire career, and even then, it's not guaranteed. So you can imagine how strange it is to see synchronicities occur around wins, between two drivers, one on their way in, and the other on their way out of the sport. And think about it like this, more plainly put, if you have two drivers, A and B, driver A wins the debut of B, and driver B wins the finale of driver A. Even on its face right there, that kind of sounds like an impossible thing to line up, right? Well, you'd be just as surprised as I was. Jack Brabham's long, illustrious career would come to a conclusion at the 1970 Mexican Grand Prix, and it was Jackie X who would put his Ferrari P1 after 65 laps. But history would tell us that as it turns out, he would just be paying it forward, as it was Jack Brabham who beat both of the Coopers in the 1966 German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. This would represent Jackie X's debut into Formula 1, thereby connecting the two drivers. Here is a list of the other drivers that share this same coincidence. And of the potentials that could happen this season, we have the following situations that have the potential to play out. Raikkonen would win Hamilton's first race, and while Raikkonen's future does remain murky, it's possible, even likely, if he does retire this season, a win from Hamilton in the finale could complete this. And same goes for Lewis. Should he take the title and record for the most drivers' championships along with it and promptly ride off into the sunset, there's a good chance that Max could win in the finale completing this one, 
given Lewis took the checkered flag in Max's debut in 2015 in Melbourne. The real question is, will Lewis retire if he wins and leave on a high? Just like another driver on this list in Alan Prost. But apparently, and I must stress this, this wouldn't at all be the same as what Nico Rosberg did. Right? Now that we've gone through some of the more interesting factoids in Formula 1 in this data party, let's close out the number one spot with a few of my favorite stat lines to watch in 2021. Specifically, the records that could fall. I'll include a couple extra in here for the bonus lightning round. So the most obvious and one that I need to spend the least amount of time on, a new mark of 8 World Drivers Championships could be set by Lewis Hamilton at the end of the season if he comes out victorious. And for this next one, Lewis would have to be stellar, but on the table is the hat trick record. Hamilton chasing the same man and Michael Schumacher currently sits on 18 while the German has a hold of this record with both hands at an impressive 22. Lewis will have to be on point for this one. Keeping in mind the hat trick is a pull, a win, and fastest lap, the pull aspect is the one he'll struggle with if I had to guess. So it seems relatively unlikely he could be successful in winning 5 of these in one season no matter how long it is but it is possible. And on top of that hat trick is also the Grand Slam, which is slightly different, but it simply adds on leading the race for 100% of the lap scheduled. The newly knighted Britain is chasing down another beast of another era in this one in Jim Clark. He would rack up this record tally in just four seasons from 1962 to 1965 in a legendary career that was cut far too short with eight Grand Slams. Hamilton currently sits at six. And while this technically is on the table, it's going to be near impossible given the new challenge from Red Bull and the aforementioned struggle on pole. Now it's not just all Lewis though, there are some other record book changes that are set to be made. This includes another battle at Mercedes but this time Valtteri Bottas who sits on 57 podiums compared to the record of the driver with the most podiums without a world drivers championship, Rubens Barrichello at 68. The Finn is just a dozen podiums shy of taking over this record. He notched a 65% podium strike rate in 2020. Applying this to the current season, he's on pace to grab 15 podiums, leaving a margin of 2 given his P3 and Sakir in the opener. Interestingly, there are two active drivers on this list. The other is Max Verstappen, who by far has the fewest races. But to be honest, I'm not sure he'll have to wait much longer to actually accomplish his first world title. Speaking of the Dutchman, he's also in prime position to grab another youngest record if he rises to the occasion. The Grand Slam is yet again in question and this time Max can become the youngest as Sebastian did it while thrashing the grid in his Red Bull at 24 years old in 119 days. Max will have until the end of the year as the final round Sunday will make Max 24 years 2 months and 5 days old. While he won't be the only youngster gunning for this, he'll be the most equipped as far as his machinery goes. Carlos Sainz Jr. also hopes to harness the power of the Ferrari anti-curse in 2021. It's been over two and a half decades since a driver started a season with the Scuderia and failed to capture a win at some point in their career. And other notable examples include Stefan Johansson and the habitually unlucky Chris Ammon. All that said, 2021 will have moments that will go down in the record books. No matter how it all plays out, we're never going to get it back. So this season, I challenge you, try to enjoy the moment a bit more. But as always, thanks for your time, thanks for being here, and I'll see you very, very soon.